Uh, okay, let's start out. Joe, would you read that quote from Lord Baden Powell? Sure. What suits one particular troop or one kind of boy in one kind of place will not suit another within a mile of it, much less those scattered over the world and existing under totally different conditions. Yes, thank you. So, you know, of course, that talks about the importance of uh, having some consistency in scouting, but also differences in, in rural communities as compared to urban or large cities. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, rural communities provide a firm scouting heritage, and they espouse the ideals of the Olson law, as do urban areas. But it has to be tailored more in rural areas for many reasons. And so let's just talk about, in our own mind, uh, what is the definition of a rural community in your mind? I think in our, so in Crossroads of the West, we have lots of rural communities, um, given that we're the entire state of Utah and also part of Wyoming and Idaho and uh, Nevada, and maybe a little bit of Northern Arizona as well. Um, a lot of them are far away from uh, maybe council headquarters. Um, although even some of us in urban communities are still far away from that. Um, they, they have, I guess my definition would be they're connected to other communities nearby, but not closely connected. There's travel involved, there's time to take to get between them. And so they maybe have less meetings because they're further apart and it takes time for everybody to get there. And, and so, you know, those participating want to participate, but they have some accommodations to be made to work differently. Exactly. That's like the perfect definition. <laughs> and in our council, even though I think Crossroads of the West, you know, we have some big cities, certainly, but much of what we do uh, reaches out to smaller communities. And so it, this, this uh, is something that's always a challenge. So the, the course of Jack D's um, is looking and understanding our unique situation as rural units and working in them. I'm from down in Price. Uh, I would say we're rural, even though at one time we had a lot of units. Now we just have a few. And so we even fit that definition more. We'll also learn methods for recruiting leaders and scouts in small and spread out communities, always a challenge, and learn methods to reduce the cost of membership for families, fundraising, and so forth, and then learn methods providing, uh, for providing scouting in small units. And it's interesting because down in Price, we, uh, we went from a lot of small units to one big unit. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it that's come with some challenges uh, everybody just and we still get, we get more young men every week who are still working on their eagles and so forth who want to join and and get registered and and uh, and complete their eagles uh, through you know through a scouting unit so uh, it requires a different approach trust is very important. Trust is earned and not granted. That's probably the case everywhere, but in rural communities, it takes time and commitment. Uh, the locals, uh, for example, our neighboring county, Emory County, of course, is part of Silver Sage, and they, for whatever reason, years ago, uh, looked at the council as uh, an intrusion on what they were trying to do and they they did their own thing in many ways and and so it was important that we work with them and develop trust and let them know we're here to support and help uh, and rural people are busy as are people in urban areas but everything seems to take longer in a rural area <laughs> and uh I don't know if you've ever looked into Lone Scout or anything like that, or if we have any Lone Scouts in our council. That I don't know. I don't know if, if do you know of any, Joe? 
I don't know of any here particularly, but I'm sure there are some. Um, again, just because they're often an area that we're not uh, well supported in scouting. Right. Yeah, I used to run into that quite a bit when I was with Transatlantic Council, although most of the troops um, were centered around large army posts or Navy stations and stuff like that. You would have like little um, lone scout areas where you had uh, an ambassadorship or a consulate or something like that, and there just wasn't anybody else around. So that was relatively common in Transatlantic. I'll bet it would be. And in the early days of scouting, I think lone scouts were quite common, probably not as common today. Uh, in in the materials, there's a characteristics of rural community. And that's a handout, with, which is quite interesting uh, to look over. And then there's also a handout on uh, facts and questions answered from the lone scout program. So those are good resources when it comes to scouting in rural communities. So our district executive, and our district executive lives up in Utah County. Uh, he lived there before the change and still does live up there. So we need to have trust in him and he needs to develop trust, uh, you know, with all of us out in these, uh, these small communities. And so it's nice, uh, you know, we've done round table for, forever zoom and i know they're starting to do them live again but but those round tables are held in springville so that's quite a ways from price so often i just join by zoom uh, so anyway as locals uh we are most comfortable here in our community we like to the way things are and the way things run and so for the professional it's very important that he learn the culture here in our in each little community that that he works in so uh what we need to do as to develop trust which is so key is locate one or two people in the community and uh you know work with them to engender their trust in being respectful and honest so we go to where they are and i remember Jim Bethel, who is our, our district commissioner for Silver Sage, and I'm an, an assistant under him. He was our professional here in this area a few years ago. And I remember, uh, and I was the district chairman, and we went and visited the mayor. We went and visited key community leaders. And that really did help to uh, involve our, our community more in scouting. And uh, of course, schools often uh, are a good source to talk to youth about the program and, and get them uh, hopefully interested in, especially now where it's just totally optional to join a scout troop because you want to and to give them the information they need. Have either of you had uh, good experiences with our experiences? <laughs> in engendering trust in the local leaders have you do you have something you could share about that oh yes i ran into a very serious problem when i was commissioner down in catalina as i said i basically took care of everybody who was south of tucson um nogales that was a serious problem first of all nogales was its own council at one time and uh -huh. um it um they got used to basically doing things their own way. Well, then they got absorbed into Catalina and they didn't much care for that. Um, and uh, the, the, the main scoutmaster there um, was in charge of the, uh, well, was a scoutmaster for the largest troop in that area. He was enormously respected and he was really quite good at what he did. He was, he was actually the council commissioner prior to that when it was its own separate council. And several times, unit commissioners tried to get down into there and talk to them and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And that did not go well. They did not want to be interfered with. Um, I found out about this, and I, it was kind of an interesting conversation that I had with the district executive, because I'm getting told all of this kind of stuff. He said, yeah, you need to get down there. And I looked at him and said, 
no, I don't. Um, <laughs> wait a minute, but we, we need you, the unit commissioner down there. I said, no, what we need to do is get invited to go down there. And because if I go in and intrude on those folks, then it's going to be a problem. Well, I was working with it, and, and there were other issues involved. There, they, it is a border city, and because it's a border city, they actually had scouts who were Mexican nationals, uh -huh. and they had enormous trouble getting through the border control point just north of Rio Rico, which is about 40 miles north of, um, of Nogales. And so they really couldn't even get involved because they were afraid their, their kids were going to get stopped at the border and, you know, things happen and it's not fair, but that's the way it goes. So basically, I worked very, very extensively with the, uh, the units just north of there. I had a new unit there, really developed well. And after about seven months, basically, I kind of developed a reputation and I got the call from him and said, Hey, come on down and talk. Totally different situation. I kind of came through that sideways. And sometimes you need to do that, especially with units that had been isolated. In my attitude, and yeah, I had my, I had my little debates with counsel about this. I said, look, it's not like they're doing bad scouting. They're doing good scouting. We know that they are. Let's not mess with them. Let's wait until we get the invitation and then we can go down there. And we did. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So, yeah, you did all the right things there. And, uh, and one thing that suggested is to locate previous scouters. And that, that's always fun, you know, to look at who's out there and they all have something to share and they're all excited to uh, talk about uh, you know, their experience in scouting. Uh, some other ideas are visiting volunteer fire departments and local law enforcement. A lot of communities have uh, uh, law enforcement uh, explorer post kind of thing going on that where they're supported and helped that way. And then uh, of course attend potluck dinners and sporting events. Um, Seems like when we do things here in this area, uh, uh, again, COVID has affected us a lot, but whenever we could get together for any kind of an event, would be a good opportunity to talk about the importance of scouting and, and acknowledge those that are involved. Any other ideas? All right, we'll go to the next slide. And so being flexible, and that's what you did, uh, Rich, in, in that area, you know, in uh, Nogales and in and, 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 and an area where it was difficult for all the scouts even to be able to get together because they came from another country, some of them. So we have to adapt and, uh, and be able to work within the community in a way that that people are appreciative and and they uh, we need to be responsive especially if uh, quite often scout groups are asked to do something to help in the community and it definitely needs to be a good experience for the young men and young women now as well as for the community so whenever we say we want to do something we want to be involved then we need to lead and that's walking and walking you're talking <laughs> so make yourself available and listen to the unit people and the, their needs and then of course uh help those people first they're the priority that are involved in the in the unit okay so uh we need to provide recognition and in rich's class we learned about some of the uh, commissioner uh, recognition that's available out there and we need to be able to uh, be present with training and and uh, we need to look at the unit situation and see the big picture uh, we, we shouldn't be the super scouter that we do everything say everything we should uh, help them 
to see what needs to be done and be supportive and spend the time, be empathetic and uh, talk to them face to face. I have a good experience with this local troop. Uh, I meet with them regularly because they're really the, the main thing going right here in our area. And it's, it's been so nice the last couple of months where we've been meeting face to face instead of on Zoom. And then with, we have to have considerations of uh, the people that are involved. We don't use labels and we don't blame, we don't take sides. There's politics and everything. And so we find challenges, but we just work our way through it. And uh, we, we help uh, be aware of the scouters life events. This, the scout master and helper that I talked about, he has big things going on in his life. He has a lot of little kids and when something's coming up that he needs uh, some help with so he can support, be supportive of his family, we need to help him and fill in. And Rich, I'm sure you experienced down in Nogales respecting cultures and lifestyles, how different they are. And uh, so we need to be creative and, and think outside of the box and look at alternative approaches. You know, if I, if, I don't know if we have time, but I can interject something kind of interesting that I ran into. That'd be um, great. That, um, one of the cultural differences that you have with the Mexican people is that it is far more matriarchal than patriarchal. Uh -huh. um, women make a lot of the decisions and the, the way that they handle things is quite different. Um, and oftentimes, I actually ran into uh, an issue with uh, with one of my new units in Rio Rico, um, with one of the assistant scoutmasters, she was a mother with the troop. Um, they tend by culture to be kind of helicopter moms. I wouldn't go you know too extreme with that, but if uh, a scout runs into a problem, mama comes to help, and they expect that when scouts have a problem, that the scoutmaster runs to help but of course we don't do that um we don't let them get into serious trouble but we let them get into trouble and we did have some cultural problems that that we had to kind of work through so that she could understand what we were trying to do as scouts and and in scouting that was actually different than than with her culture and it did it did take some time and it did work out in the end um but it was an inter interesting cultural difference that you have here. And I think one of the points that they're really trying to make here, and I've certainly seen this, and Joe, I'm sure that you've seen the same thing as well, is that each little pocket community in Utah has its own history, its own culture, um, its own problems, its own um, positive attributes, things that they're proud of. You need to be aware of those kinds of things. Know something about that town and that little pocket community. And, that, and they keep referring to that out there. You know, urban communities tend to be relatively homogenous, okay? But rural communities are not like that. They have their own unique aspects and they have to be respected. Yeah, very, very well said. Uh, in the lesson, it talks about mo many rural communities are agriculturally uh, connected. And so, you know, things kind of center around the farm and, and what time of year it is and what season. And that, that's changing, I think, in America. But still, there's lots of concerns uh, for a rural area that, that in the urban area, it's totally different. So, yeah, I would think that probably one thing that you wouldn't want to do is go down to Colville and start, go start talking about the Green New Deal. Yes, that's right. You know? <laughs> oh, not wise. It doesn't matter what your personal philosophies are on that one. Yeah, that's probably going to turn folks off. That's exactly right. Yeah, and I've experienced even here in Price that we we have Hispanic youth in our uh, unit and. And what I've experienced, even though with mayoral order and the woman says a lot of things, uh, when everything's said and done, 
the the father in the home says this is it and and we've had some struggles trying to uh, you know work with scouts who the, the father has has a different idea and, and that's it and uh and so i know exactly what you're talking about so now reducing costs and this is an issue everywhere but uh you know for example this troop here in helper they've decided this coming august uh, they're going to run the colorado river and that river run is going to cost about three hundred dollars for each boy and leader that that uh, participates and very many of these young men come from homes where uh their parents aren't going to be able to to pay three hundred dollars so this last week in in the troop meeting the scoutmaster uh posed the concern of how to raise money and one thing we've done here in our area and i think other areas have done is posting flags on lawns for a certain fee for six major holidays during the year and the scoutmaster brought up the concern that they've been doing it in helper which is a smaller community but he hasn't had a lot of help it's just been some of the adult help uh, some of the committee and the youth the boys haven't participated like they should so he he and now a lot of boys from price are also uh involved in the sponsoring uh institution is the the veterans the veterans of foreign wars here in price and they would like flags posted on their lawns so the scoutmaster posed the uh concern that he doesn't have time to go do all that he needs a lot more support and help and he met the parents attended this last meeting this last week and the parents were unanimously in support of of pursuing this so that number one they'd have funds to pay for their their scout to go on this uh, river run this summer but also uh you know that the scoutmaster and a few other leaders and a few boys aren't doing it every time that they that they all participate and they all help so i thought that was a very productive discussion um uh, and also uh we one nice thing is with uh, the LDS Church discontinuing scouting, you can go into a thrift shop such as Desert Industries or others and find uniforms. And so uh, uh, I know this local unit, they have a uniform bank now and it's, it's working successfully. Uh, they can use a t-shirt, you know, for, for, uh, for activities that bonds them together uh if they don't have the official uniform although i think the the scouts in our area really like to have the uniform and look forward to that and uh and also combining units for activities there is another unit in price besides this larger unit and there's times when they should and could uh save funds by combining for activities and raising money so that you can provide a campership or help a young man, you know, with those fees toward camp, as well as uh, uh, just membership, paying for the BSA membership, which has increased lately. So they're talking about in rural areas, sometimes a den chief can't travel to a, a neighboring town. So you could have a den aide involved uh you could have uh, instead of just an eight-year-old or a nine or a ten-year-old we blow you can combine dance and combine ages uh again load scout for cubs and boy scouts is available and uh, wagon wheel troops where you have weekly patrol meetings and monthly troop meetings which is more realistic uh, have a patrol within each of the little communities and then a, a big troop meeting monthly uh, thus far we in our area we still have the weekly troop meetings and then school bus dens and controls uh you know uh by getting young men together or youth together 
that are in a certain bus area uh, that are together riding the bus and, and experiencing scouting at the same time. And then mailboxes for roundtable, emailing and information, which of course we're all learning to do now. And then again, involving other units. Uh, there are cub units in our area and it's uh, important we involve them so they can see what the scouts are doing and look forward the young men and cub scouts looking forward to becoming a scout. And there's lots of references out there for scouting in rural communities and uh, guidebooks and so forth. So that's important to have. Well, I blurred through it. Uh, so Mike, I've, I've got to ask you a question. I haven't heard a single word about the girl troops down in your area. What's happening? Yeah, and that is a very good question. Uh, this larger unit 271, uh, thus far, they haven't had girls, uh, uh, to my knowledge, express an interest in being enrolled in the troop. And I, I think that day is coming because the Scoutmaster has, I think, five assistants, and several of those assistants have daughters uh and then that are younger at this point and i'm sure involved in cubs and then uh, two of the leaders have their wives that are involved uh, with the order of the arrow and things uh, so i know it's coming uh but i'm not familiar at least in price helper with uh any young women being involved uh, and there's a unit over in castle dale i'm not familiar that they have any and there's a unit there's a unit in Moab and a unit in Blanding or no uh, Monticello and I'm not aware of any of them <laughs> so I know so Joe coming, what but... are you seeing I, I I can see the reason there's probably not is it's a new thing and if nobody wants usually the problem I have even in the urban community is finding the leaders to lead the new unit because it's a for most it is a new unit um, and doubling that up with another troop gets tricky and um, it's getting that involvement from the adults first to make the unit happen. Again, the leaders have daughters that would probably participate, but and some daughters don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> not, I, yeah. Scouting is not for everybody. I, I no, agree. It, and I get that. I agree it's coming. I know it is. Now, I have had quite a bit of experience. Uh, uh, our Silver Sage, which is a big chunk of Utah, you know, Southern Utah County, all of Juab County, all of Carbon, Emory, Grand, San Juan. We did our Klondike Derby at Mapledale uh, the last week in February. We had, I think, 150 youth, young men and young women, and we had over 50 adults there, so over 200. And uh, I was a judge uh, for some of the events. Uh, and as I went around, there were probably four girl units there involved. Most of them, one, I think, from uh, Spanish Fork and one from Orem. And, you know, they were just really excited to be there and be involved. So I, I've seen, you know, it coming and, and how excited those young women are to be involved. Huh. I wonder, and I'm, I'm, I don't know the answer to this, um, and oftentimes intuition can lead one very far astray. Um, but, um, well, first of all, I didn't have sons. I had two daughters, okay? They wanted to join the Boy Scouts, all right? And although they were a little bit young when I was a scoutmaster, they saw what was going on. I actually took them along with, with me on, on a couple of things, you know, so they could see it. And they really wanted to be involved in that kind of a thing. Um, this is, I wonder if there really is a, a separation between rural and urban scouting and the interest of girls in scouting. I mean, we have heard, shoot, since I was a Boy Scout, that girls wanted to get involved in scouting. They were sick of selling cookies and sitting around sewing stuff. They wanted to get out there and camp and all the rest of that. 
Well, okay, so where the heck are they? I don't know. Now, the question is, number one, is it a rural versus an urban thing? Is it, and let's face it, the nature of our culture here in Utah and in Idaho that the girls are not being encouraged or they're just not that interested? Oh, I'm going to find out. Uh, you guys know probably that I'm part of the National Camp Accreditation Program, okay? And I go far astray. And every time that I go to a camp, the council commissioner has, is going to be there. They want to be there for there. Well, guess what? I'm going to be all over Colorado this year in these different commission, uh, in these different councils. I'm going to find out what's going on there and see if I can bring that back. Um, and that might be able to either confirm or deny my thoughts on this. Um, now, Joe, you've got like venture and explorer posts in a, in a ship, don't you? So I have a, a girls troop, a boys troop, a family pack, and <laughs> another troop, a boys troop only. And then you I need to find ship. somebody else because you're going to get hit by a bus and everything's going to collapse. <laughs> it's going to be a scouting bus full of kids going to a camp. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, you've sat through my classes. You know how much I emphasize deputies and how important that you have people to replace. You need to be replaced by about five people. Yep. So you my my answer, my answer to your question, Rich, is <laughs> there are more girl troops in Utah County in our council, probably. I, I don't know for the rest of the council, but I would guess most of the girls troops are in our council or in our, in our county, um, as opposed to the other, other counties in the state, um, at least for former National Parks Council areas, um, only because there are adults who wanted to start the units. I know there are several that I'm somewhat affiliated with or connected with their leaders that folded last year and combined into one. They merged because they didn't have enough leader support and that was the only way to survive. So slightly more travel you know a couple more minutes to a different part of the town um rather than that and i would guess in the urban areas again it's an adult problem not a youth problem wow if the adult leaders aren't there to promote it and and invite and encourage and get the youth to attend then the the, the truth doesn't happen um especially for those that are going to be new into scouting now kind of what we're looking at in utah county as well or in scouting in general is the way to start that is to invite them into the cub pack get the kids right. doing cub scouts and once they've done the cub scouts and boys and girls in their appropriate dens then when they turn 11 or, or 12 depending on when they're going to advance from uh being a weeblo or arrow of light year then they want to do boy scouts or scouts bsa the full the full shebang going to all the camping and activities and that's Again, that's a timing issue. It's only been two exactly. years, three years, no, four years. This will be year five for Cub Scouts. No, that's not right. I can't remember yeah, when, but pack, I, when family pack This started. is going to take time. There's no question about it because Cubs is a primary feeder. And yep. we know that just like Scouts is a primary feeder into Explorer Posts and Ventures. Yep. Um, yeah, I just, I wonder about this. Um, I'm seeing tons of young ladies at our camps working as staff. I mean, you saw that in Mabel. Yep. Um, right. I certainly saw that up there in the, uh, in the Teton base. I've seen it all over the place because I'm seeing camps all over. Okay, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just being a little bit impatient. I don't know. And I think it's, it's still It's going to take time. I think it's still early too. A lot of the young women in scouting and Scouts BSA right now were venturers and came back to earn the eagle because they were still the appropriate age to do so. Right. And so next year is kind of the year when we find out who's really a young woman that wants to do scouting because she can, because they weren't already involved previously or we're just barely starting right. kind of a thing. So next year is kind yeah. of like the, the year when that'll get kind of leveled out. But I, I don't, there are still far more boy troops than there are girl troops in scouts right say. and and that's to be expected i just wonder if we're going to have a special and unique problem in rural communities um not just in having adult leaders uh, but just having enough density 
I, I don't think to the, to the point of this discussion that uh, rural communities are any different in getting young women units together. It yeah. again comes down to adults and, and the community willingness to support that. Yeah. But I do think I th that it is a matter of demographics. Like you said, you know, Utah County has, uh, you know, I don't know how many girl troops, but many, many more population. And so, you know, there's the girls get together. And I, I think in rural communities, uh, you might have one or two, whereas in Utah County, you've got uh, 10 or 20. Now that may change. Hopefully it will. And, uh, and young women will see that that's a good. And I think uh, one of you said uh, Cub Scouting is the key. And I do know there are quite a few girls in in our area involved in Cub Scouting. So it's just a matter of time.